All right, welcome to some new slides. These are going to help us learn how to count things, which I guess we don't know enough of right now. This is going to build on top of some stuff that you've probably seen in a math class before. So yeah, let's keep on trucking from there. But we're always going to try to tie it back to our cool new mathematical concepts, usually set theory. So let me teach you sum and product rules that you've probably seen before that are very intuitive. Uh, but we're going to define them in terms of sets, finite sets of things, because that's how mathematics works these days. So, all right, here is the product rule. So if you have, oh gosh, this is very unhappy right now. If you have, there we go. If there are A ways of doing one thing, all right, and B ways of doing some other thing, then if you want to do both things, there are A times B options, right? Because you got A ways to do the first thing and B ways to do the second thing. Like there's A times B options of doing both, all right? And so that actually has to do with Cartesian products of sets. So like, let me prove that to you. Let's say that you go and get ice cream. And so you go to your favorite ice cream shop and today they only have three options, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. And then, so that's like, that's one set, right? We can model that with the set of options, I for ice cream. So it's got three things in it. And then also maybe you want a topping on your ice cream. So uh, today they're, they only have sprinkles. So you can get sprinkles on your ice cream or you could get no sprinkles. Does that make sense? They get two options for toppings for set S. So let's say you wanted an ice cream. How many different combinations of ice cream and uh, toppings are there here? There's going to be six, right? It's going to be three times two. Uh, and you can think about that in terms of Cartesian products, in terms of tuples of things, right? Because every option for your ice cream, ice cream and uh, toppings pair looks like this. Option, your option is always an element of I cross S, Cartesian product, isn't it? Like this is my favorite combination of these options. I want vanilla and I want sprinkles. Do you see how that's a tuple? Not the idea. And so the question is, how many different tuples can you make? Because that, that tells you how many different kinds of ice cream and uh, topping combinations you could have. And there's exactly six, right? Because there's three options for this one. And that's independent of the two options that you have for this one. So you have six total, like vanilla sprinkles, vanilla no sprinkles, chocolate sprinkles, chocolate no sprinkles. You see that? So six total. And so really, you're thinking about how big is this Cartesian product? So in general, if you want to pick some stuff from n sets, you're trying to build a tuple of size n of Cartesian products using a Cartesian product of all those n sets. Okay, And so what's the size of that? How many options do you have total? It ends up being, because you can make the, ends up being the sizes of each of them multiplied together. All right, so that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on there. And that's called the product rule. All right, it's very, very obvious, but we haven't really def defined it in terms of set theory before, probably. All right. So naturally, there's also a sum rule. So let's say that there are A ways of doing one thing and B ways of doing another thing. And you can't do both, right? So if you want to choose what you want to do, right? There's, you, got, uh, you can do thing A, or I guess thing X. You got A ways of doing thing X and B ways of doing thing Y. And you got to choose one or the other. Then there's, in total, right, A plus B ways to pick something to do. I hope that makes sense. So, uh, and that has to do with unions of a set. Okay, so like, let's say that, I don't know, maybe you could do an outside thing, outside uh, option. Let's do, let's use set X, why not? So you could do an outside uh, activity. Maybe you wanna do that. That could be like hiking, or you can go swimming maybe. So two options for outside activities. And then inside activities, you can also make a set, right? Of like, maybe you could uh, watch a movie, You could eat dinner, like have a meal. So two options for set Y. But like, if you want to pick something to do and you're not sure if you want to do it outside or inside, like you have this many options from this one and this many options from this one. Does that make sense? So it's just the union of the sets because there there are no overlap. Uh, it's like it's really just like it's asking like, all right, these are all your options. This is the union of all these things, all these individual sets, like outside and inside activities. What's the size of that? Because that's giving you how many options you have total. Well, it's just the size of each of those sets together because they, they're not going to overlap, right? So that's the idea. So like you have four options of things to do. You see that? That's what's going on there. 
So yeah, the last thing I want to tell you is the bijection rule. So if you have a bijection, that means you have an, an invertible function, right? If, you, if there is a bijection from one set to another, then the two sets must be the same size if they're finite, if they're finite, all right? This is only for finites, that's what I'm talking about right now. Then the two sets have the same cardinality, same size, all right? So yeah, so that's just saying this in math. Let s and t be two finite sets. If there's a bijection from s to t, like here's s, they must have the same size. All right, so here's s, here's t. If there's a bijection from s to t, like there's some way, like it's one to one and on to, yeah, that gives you a way of inverting this function. And like there's no overlap, there's no duplication, which means there's always the same amount of things, if it's finite at least. Do you see that? So like naturally there must, if there's three things coming out, there must be three things going in for this to be a bijection. That's the only way for that to be possible, all right? And so that's telling you if, if there is a bijection somehow, somebody gives you one, and it's a fine, they're two finite sets, that means that uh, those cardinalities are the same, all right? So that's just a good start. Hopefully this makes a lot of sense. Maybe this one is the kind of the new one. Uh, we can generalize that product rule. So uh, let's see. Here's my silly example. Let's say that it's the it's the cat meme Olympics right now. It's the season for that, and there are 15 contestants in the cat meme Olympics. So the question is, this will teach us the generalized product rule. How many different ways can we give out the medals to the winning cat memes? All right, gold, silver, and bronze. We only have three medals, but we got 15 contestants. All right. So the way that you got to think about this. All right. You've probably seen this idea before. Uh, I know I did in like an Algebra 2 class or something. But there are, well, who's going to get the goal? The question is like, you got all these people, you got all these 15 contestants, right? And the idea is, well, how many options, right, if you're just trying to think about all the possibilities, like you don't know who's better than anybody else. Uh, you got all these options. The way that you discover like how many different ways are there to do this thing is to like pretend, right? How could you give out the gold? How many options do you have to give out the gold right now? Well, nobody's won anything yet, so like you can give the gold to any of the 15 people, right? There are 15 people who could win gold, and then you have to you have to give out the silver medal to uh, to somebody after that. Let's say that's your order. Well, now you've given gold to one person, you have 14 people left to give the silver to. Do you see how that's going to give us our possibilities? Like maybe the silver goes to this person. It doesn't matter who, but there were 14 options, arbitrary options. But then two people have won, you can't like win multiple medals. And so now there's only 13 people left out of the 15 who could win the bronze. Like maybe it's this guy that gets it. This is the bronze cat meme. Does that make sense? So in total then, because like we've made, this is all generic people involved. 15 ways to give out the gold, then 14 ways to give out the silver to the rest of the people, 13 ways to give out the bronze, that means there are 2,730 ways to give out those medals, 2,730 different ways uh, of outcomes, okay? And that's called the generalized product rule because it involves some multiplication, okay? And so this is usually used for counting things called permutations, which I'm sure you've heard of, but maybe the word is is either new to you or like it's been a while since you've heard it, but we'll learn about those in a second too. Okay, so that's the generalized product rule. Just kind of like start subtracting one, and that makes a lot of sense in theory. Okay, so here is here's my question for you. Give this a try. I got a couple questions for you uh, in rapid fire. So, all right. So here are a bunch of sets of characters for like making a password. So like your password could include some digits. The, the digits set has obviously the digits the digits in it. Uh, you could include lowercase letters in your password. So those are uh, that's in the letter set, and then you can have these special characters in your password, only four different ones, no exclamation points or anything, just these, all right? So uh, what I want you to do is try to get, uh, figure out the number of passwords that give you, uh, that satisfy, satisfy these properties. So you better have a password, you can only have a password of length five, six, or seven, all right? So that's controlling how big your passwords are. Uh, and then the characters in your password can be special characters, digits, or letters, uh, but the first character it's got to be special. It can't be a letter. It could be a, a digit or a special character, but the first letter of any of these length five, six, or seven passwords can't be a letter. All right. So try to think about that. Read this carefully. Your string must be of, your password must be of these sizes. Uh, they can have these different options from each of these sets, but the first character can't be a letter. How can you how can you encode that and count these numbers? All right. So let me scroll back to these options. I want to use some of these ideas, but you you think about it. 
All right. So the secret is to consider these strings separately. Let's look, think about the five character passwords, the six character passwords, and the seven character passwords differently because they they don't overlap. Then we can just add those options together. Okay. So length five, like let's say that we have a length. We're trying to build a set of all the length five passwords. We'll call it length five. And what we really want to know is how many. So the cardinality of that set is what we're trying to get at. And so the question is, well, all right, what's got to go in this password? How many different ways are there to do things? Well, the first character can't be a letter. So all those characters are different from one another. So I'm going to use the product rule. So like there's A ways of choosing the first character, B ways of choosing the second character, stuff like that. So all right, if the first character can't be a letter, what are its options? It could be either a special character or a digit. And so that's going to be, well, how many different options are there for that character? Well, it's the size of the digits plus the size of the special character. So I'll call those DNS. Do you see how that's exactly how many options you have for the first letter? It's like it could have been a digit or it could have been a special character. They don't overlap. So sum rule for those. And then after that, I'm going to multiply this by how many options do we have for the second letter, third letter, fourth letter. But like the, the remaining four letters, they're all fine. They're, they can all be any of these. And so for the second character, for example, what are your options? It could be a digit letter or a special character. So for the second character, it could be uh, you have that many options for if it were a digit, uh, if it were a letter, I'll, I'll use L for that, or a special character. So you have that many options total. Just sum them all up for your next character. And then you do the same thing for the, the remaining characters. So let's just take that to the power of 4, because you're going to multiply, right? For, uh, let's see. Oh gosh, there. That works, I guess. So for example, like your length 5 password is like this many options for the first character, this many options for the second, third, and fourth, and fifth character. So that's why we're taking it to the fourth power. And they're all different, so it's the product rule. But it's this. It's the sum rule for the inner parts for each letter. You see that? I don't know if that makes sense. So that's going to be your first character. Those are your options for the first character. And these are your options for the other remaining four characters. OK? Uh, and so the same thing is true for the length 6 strings, length 6 passwords. What's the size of that set? How many different passwords are there with these rules in mind? Well, for the first character, you can again still only have a digit or a special character. So it's that many options for the first character. And then for the remaining five characters this time, what do you got? Well, you can choose any character. So how many options do you have for each individual character? It's all of those things, the cardinality of all of those things together. So that's how many options you have for the second character and the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So we're going to take that to the fifth power. Does that make sense? And so we're, we're trying to like, we don't want to make the set. We just want to know how big the set is. That's what counting is all about. All right. So the answer, our answer is, well, if you go and compute these things, I'm not going to do that for you, but you can figure it out. It's the size of that length five set plus the size of that length six set plus the size of the length seven set. See that? And you do this at length 7 in the exact same way. And that gives you your options. You see how like you're, you're breaking it down in terms of each individual character using a combination of the product rule and the sum rule. All right, let me try this one with you now. So let's say that uh, we're trying to figure out about license plates. In California, for now at least, license plates in California look like this. Uh, for regular cars, it's digit, one digit, then three letters, then three digits. We're about to run out of digits right here, so I'm interested to see what's about to happen. But that'll take a few years. But um, okay, so here, here these are, and let's pretend we want to count how many license plate numbers are possible under the following uh, like side condition. So let's say we want to count how many different license plate numbers are there if we pretend that California didn't allow any digits or letters to appear more than once. So like, if you have this. Uh, this license plate is fine, uh, but like it, you couldn't have a six here because you already duplicated it. That's kind of what's going on there. All right, so that's okay. But like multiple digits or x x z six eight nine, like because of the duplicates, we don't like it. 
All right, so that, that one wouldn't be allowed. So how many, how many license plate numbers that look like this that use different things always uh, are there? And so that's going to involve the generalized product rule, isn't it? All right. First of all, we need the size of these sets. So that's the idea. So this one, this one was allowed. This one was not allowed, right? Uh, here, I'll draw it separately since I want that check mark somewhere. We there. That's the goal there. Uh, so yeah, those are what our license plates need to look like. And let's figure out the sizes of all these sets. So like we had uh, for digits, what are our digits? How many digits are there? One, two, all the way to nine, right? So uh, 10 total. And then for characters, for letters, got A through all the way through zero. It's only capitals, right? Only capitals. And that is a, that is definitely a Z. So 26 of those. And so the idea is, well, all right, let's count. And let's try to do it in order. So for the first digit on our license plate, we've, we've chosen nothing else. So we got 10 options for that first digit. Could be anything, one through, or zero through nine. So 10 options for the first digit. And then we got to pick a letter. We haven't picked any letters yet, only numbers. So we have 26 options for what letter we put there. Could be A through zero, A, A through Z. But then we have to pick another letter right after. And we've already picked one of them. Let's say we picked X, for example. We cannot use X again. So we have only 25 options for letters to choose from now for that second letter. And same for the third letter. We've chosen two. There's only 24 other letters in the alphabet to choose from now for that third letter. All right, for the, the next number, we've picked one of the digits, like maybe it was the six. We cannot reuse that six. So we have nine options for, uh, for those digits left. And then similar for the rest. Like now we have eight digits left for that uh, second to last digit. And for the final digit, we've used one, two, three digits already. So we can't use any of those ones. Again, we have seven options left. So that would be the answer in a universe where uh, you didn't allow duplication like that. And that is OK in California, for now at least. But like that's what would happen uh, if you wanted to pretend. All right. Yeah, let's keep on trucking. Let's talk about permutations now. So this will be fun. So a permutation, there, there's a couple different definitions that I need to talk to you about. So uh, there is something called an R permutation, and then there's something called just a normal permutation. So let's, let's do the normal kind first. So a permutation without an R in it is a sequence that contains each element of a set exactly once. All right. So let's say that we have a set. A, A holds one, two, three, four. And so a permutation of the set A is uh, in order to those elements. A permutation is a, it's a tuple. A permutation is a tuple. I'll say that down here and I'll say it right now too. So like what's an ordering of these guys? Well, like two, one, three, four, maybe. That's an ordering and it's gotta be in order. So we gotta use a tuple, right? It's gonna involve a Cartesian product of the set where we can't have duplicates, all right? So that's a that's a valid ordering permutation of the elements. Uh, same with three, one, two, four. That's another permutation of those elements. You see that? So this is this right here is a permutation. There's two options right there. Permutation of the elements of A. Okay. So that's that. Uh, and there happen to be exactly n factorial different permutations, where n is the size of the set. So this is a size 4 set. So there are exactly four factorial options. Uh, and you can kind of use the generalized product rule to tell you why. Like for the first thing in your tuple, you have four options. And then for the next thing, you've used one. So you have three for that one, two for the next, and one for the last. See that? So that's pretty nice. Uh, so that's what that means. That's a normal permutation. You have n factorial number of options where the n is the size of the set. An R permutation is when you want to take a, f a little bit less. You don't want to take the whole set and rearrange the whole thing. You want to arrange pieces of it. So an R permutation is a sequence of R items with no repetitions still, all from the same set. Okay. So for example, uh, considering the set A still with one, two, three, four, you can just talk about size two tuples. That is, this is a uh, two permutation. We say this is a two permutation of A. 
2 perm of A because it's a size 2 tuple and uh, it's taken two things, no duplicates. All right, and then so so are so some other two permutations of a are like take a two and a three, take a four and a three. It's got to be elements and can't be duplicates. Uh, take a one and a two. All right, and I think you can imagine how many options you have for that one. So uh, we can count the number of r permutations uh, by saying p n r. All right, so there is a formula for that, but I want to show it to you intuitively as well. So PNR, that's a function that computes the, the number of options that you have for your kind of permutation. So what we're trying to do uh, is calculate uh, P4R, 4R, 4, 2, right? P42, because we want the number of R permutations from a set with N elements. That's what that is. So we have a set of four elements, and we want to know how many two permutations we can have. Well, what are... What is that? What is that answer just intuitively? Well, for the first element, you got four options, right? Because there's four things. And then for the second element, you used one. You, you can't have duplicates. You got three things left over. That's four times three equals 12. And you can get that from this formula if you don't want to remember that intuitively. You can just memorize the formula if you need to. But uh, PNR is always the number of n. R permutations of a uh, set of size n is always n factorial over n minus r factorial. So. We can get both of those. That's going to be uh, n factorial, 4 factorial over n minus r factorial. So n is 4, r is 2. So 4 minus 2 is 2. So that's 2 over 2 factorial. And that's equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 2 times 1. And of course, those cancel. And that leaves you with 4 times 3, which is exactly the same. OK? So either way you want to think about it, I kind of like the intuitive way, honestly. But uh, this is why, all right? That's your that's your easy formula, and so the number of permutations in total is going to be uh, if you want to use this formula, it's it's like p n n. You want to count the number of permutations of the si set of size n, uh, and you're taking n things at a time. So that's how that generalizes. But yeah, every kind of permutation that you could make is a tuple, all right? It's like give an order to these things, give an order, some order, pick some things out. So that's a permutation. That's what that means. And those are very useful, all right? So we can talk about the order in which we get things. It's really nice. So here's a silly example that kind of has to do with permutation. So um, a couple of years ago in South Africa, they had a lottery. Maybe it was like a national lottery, but you can read more about it here. I for I've forgotten most of the details. But they, they ended up investigating their lottery after, like they got, you know how a, lot of, how a lottery works, right? You got to like spin the, the machine with the balls in it, and then the balls fall out uh, with numbers on them. And so they apparently, in this order, they drew 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, which is hilarious. And so they got investigated because everybody thought that that was very unlikely, okay? Uh, and so that was, that was an outcome. And we can use a, it's essentially a permutation of all the balls. Let's say that there are 50 balls total for their lottery. They drew 5, then 6, then 7, then 8 then 9, then 10, right, in that order. When they could have drawn any of the other ones, right, in any other order, like they could have drawn 50, then 42, then 1, then 8, then 7, then 23. But they drew this one. How likely was it for them to draw that one? It's pretty unlikely, right? So the odds will end up being uh, 1 over this, P56, right? Because let's say you've got 50 balls to, to choose from. You're, you're, those are in the spinner right now number of lottery balls and this is how many balls you're drawing number number of those things to pick out and so what is p56 it is this 50 times 49 48 47 46 45 it's a large number and this was just one out of the, all of those options so what were the odds one over that all right so it's a one in a little over 11 billion right chance so that's why they were investigated I guess technically if you have enough lotteries this will happen eventually but uh, they thought this was a little fishy so now you can see why now you can figure out like what are those odds okay so here's a question for you this might take a, a little bit of thought but uh, it's it's a fun idea and it's very useful all right so here's your question we have uh, people are at a wedding. There's ten people in the uh, ten important people, I guess, right now in the at, in the wedding party, and they all want to take a picture together, right? So ten people total, and the bride and the groom are part of those ten. All right. So 
Uh, my question to you is, how many ways are there to line up those 10 people if the bride and the groom are included in the 10, and the groom must be to the immediate left of the bride in the photo? It doesn't matter where they are, but the, they better be in that order. It better be groom than bride. All right? So here's the... Here's the groom and the bride. They're like they want their good sides or something. It's like here's the groom, and then here's the bride. They have to be in that order when you're taking it. Groom better be to the left, all right? Everybody else, like they could have been on the edge over here, and like everybody could have been on this side. They could have been on this edge, and everybody could have been over here, or they could be somewhere in the middle. Doesn't matter. Count all the different options where this is their order, right? They got to be groom then groom to the left of the bride. Okay, so give that a try. So the secret is, like, it doesn't matter where you put these guys, they just got to be in that order. So like, you can put a couple people over here, put a couple people over here, or they could be on an edge, doesn't matter, as long as they are a unit. And honestly, that's the secret. Treat them, right, because this is one piece that you got to keep together, right? Count them as one person, as one ch chunk. Count as one person. That's pretty intuitive, right? So like, really, there's not 10 people, 10, 10 entities that you're lining up. There's nine entities, right? Because these guys go together in that exact order. So all right, the answer then is going to be, well, how many options do you have to for which entity comes first? You got nine, uh, eight normal people, and then one chunk of a groom and a bride together. You can put nine entities first, right? Those are That's how many options you have for who goes first. And I guess I have to put who in quotes now, because the bride and the groom could come first, but they got to go together. They're one entity, one unit. Okay. And then after that, like, either, like, you picked a normal person or you picked the bride and the groom, you have eight options left for the next person in the line, then seven options for the next person in the line, six options all the way down to one option for the last person. They are forced uh, to go in the last slot. Uh, and so that's going to be nine factorial options total. Is that interesting? So it's a permutation, really. You're counting permutations, not of 10 people, though, of nine things, right? Because one thing is the, the groom and bride together in the order that they wanted to be photographed in. OK, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, let's keep on trucking. Let's talk about how to count uh, subsets now. So this is a useful thing to want to know how to do. So how many subsets of this set are there? Right? So you got a uh, set A of five things total. So you're trying to ask what is, essentially, what's the cardinality of the power set, right? Because the power set is the number of subsets. And so that is 2 to the fifth power, isn't it? Isn't it? Because that's 32 total, right? Uh, it's 2 to the fifth because like, if you want, like, you can think about it this way. Like, Do I take the 1 or do I not take the 1? Do I take the 2 or do I not take the 2? You have two options for each of these elements and they multiply together. You see that? So that's how many subsets you have of a size uh, something set. And so remember that the power set is is the set of all the subsets. You got uh, the empty set. You got all the size 1 subsets with just the 1, maybe, just the 2, dot, 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 all the way to the, the entire set was it's a, is a subset of itself, technically. 1, 2. Three, four, five. I don't like the way I've been drawing my threes. There we go. Four, five. That's what a power set looks like. And so counting that, uh, instead of enumerating it, you can just like, all right, either I take this one or I don't for my subset that I'm trying to consider. Either I take this one or I don't. So two options for each of the five elements. So two to the fifth power. That's how you do it. Right? You can also ask the question of how many subsets of a certain size are there of a set. So uh, for size 1, there are exactly five subsets of size 1, right? Because you have one of each of those elements, right? What about for your size 5 subsets? That's one, that one's also easy. Like, you can only have all of them together. The order doesn't matter for a subset, right, for any set. So you only have one size 5 set subset. What about your size 3 subsets? Then you got 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 5, maybe 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 5. You can try to write it out, but like, that's difficult because you don't want to count duplicates, right? You can't you like use a product rule very easily because like one two three that is a, the same set as three two one. You do not like it's not tuples anymore; it's sets. So there's something different. You don't want to double count, triple count. All right. So 
let's figure this out. How, how many how many subsets of size three are there in this size five set? All right, so let's 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 do that problem first, and then we'll try to generalize it. All right, so like we are kind of there, right? If we, if we try to use permutations, we can kind of get there. Like ask for all the three permutations, right? Permutations get us most of the way there. P53, right, is going to tell us how many permutations of length 3 there are. So that's like 145 is a permutation. But also, 154 is a separate permutation, but they're different if you consider them as subsets. Right, sorry, wait, what do I want to say? 145, and I think I said that wrong. 154, they're, the, they're different permutations, right, different three permutations, but also, though, if you consider them as just elements of a set, they are the same set. So if you're trying to generate all the different three permutations, you're going to overcount. It's like you're going to have these a couple times. You see that? You're going to have them a few too many times, right? Because you just want to count each of these. This should be one unit, okay? That would overcount. But P53 is almost there, right? Because we'd see like, for example, one, two, and three. You'd see one, two, three, then one, three, two, two, one, three. Those are all meant to be all these ones, right? They're all supposed to stand for the same subset, one, two, three because order doesn't matter for sets. And so because that order doesn't matter, we kind of have to divide by how many times we're going to overcount each of those elements, right? We end up each we end up counting, uh, right, each subset because it's appearing in every possible order. How many how many different or orderings of those are there? 3 factorial, right? We end up counting each of those uh, 6 times, right? So we want to divide by 6. Does that make sense? So we like to count each of those just once, and so that means we have to divide by the factorial of the subset size. Because like if we have a size 3 subset that we're trying to generate right now, that means that we're going to see those things 3 factorial times in duplicates with different orderings. Does that make sense? So if we just take our original number, which we overcounted a little bit, if we divide by how many times we're going to overcount, we're good. So the count in total then is equal to, uh, we got P53 over 3 factorial. Does that make sense? That's the number of normal permutations over our overcounting issues. All right, so there's that one. And so that's going to be equal to, well, five P53 is 5 times 4 times 3. And then 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. Those 3s cancel. And so that's going to be 20 over 2 which is 10. So there's apparently 10 size 3 subsets in a size 5 set. All right, And the technical term for what we just did is counted, uh, regenerated a combination. All right? We counted the number of combinations, and that's the same as subsets. All right? So we just kind of solved for C, uh, C53. All right? So CNR, in general, is the number of R subsets, or R combinations. Oh, it's a C in a set with n elements. So you can write it as CNR. So we just solve for C53. You could also say, uh, you could also write it like this. So this this kind of syntax is also the same. So we did C53. That does not look like a C to me. So C53 is what we just calculated. Number of combinations of a, a th size 3 subsets of a size 5 original set. All right. Also, we have this one. 5, 3 in this way. This is called a, uh, and both of these were equal to 10, right? So this was e these were both equal to 10. This syntax is called, we say, choose, n choose r, right? If you, if you have this written like this, you pronounce this as n choose r. This is 5 choose 3, right? So you have a size 5 subset, you're choosing three things, I'm trying to count, right? Choose in size three subsets. So the number there is 10, the answer is 10. All right, so n choose r. So this is five choose three. The answer was 10. That's how we said that. It's one way to say it at least. Uh, and again, repetitions are not allowed because we're, we're using sets, and so we had to divide by those options. And so in general, it's always going to be that. It's going to be PNR. So I get all the permutations, but we overcounted a bunch of times for each permutation. Each r sized permutation is going to see itself in different orderings r factorial times. So we divide by that. All right, and so if we, if we expand the definition of P and R, we can uh, turn it into this, all right, and maybe cross out some stuff. So it's going to be n factorial over R factorial times n minus R factorial. So that's how you calculate n choose R or CNR. 
the number of R subsets or R combinations in a set with N elements, all right? So yeah, every combination that you can pick out, like, I don't know, R, one, two, three, or one, two, four, those are sets and the order doesn't matter, right? And that's why we're dividing by stuff, all right? So yeah, every combination that we generate, like one, two, three, one, two, four, etc., two, three, four, those are all sets, all right? And so you've probably seen this before in a math class. I know I, I saw this in my high school once upon a time. They probably still teach it. And so your math teachers, when they were saying, like they're treating, telling you the difference between combinations and permutations. No, oh, sorry about my timer. Uh, when they were telling you the difference, they were like, for combinations, the order doesn't matter, all right? So now you know why. Right now, they're they're trying to say in an easy way, not trying to teach you set theory, but they're trying to use set theory. They're trying to say order doesn't matter because we're trying to generate sets here, and sets do not have an order. That's the idea. So that's that is combinations, and uh, yeah, so that's a it's a fun idea. Okay, so here is uh, a question for you now. So let's say we've got this set S that holds these six things, these six letters. And my question for you now is, how many subsets of S have either two or three elements? Can you count them all? So like, I guess that one subset holding two elements is AC. Another one is like BD. There's also BC. There's a bunch. That's a bunch of size two. And then what about the size three you got? Uh, I don't know. I've got, if I can draw a curly brace. A C E. You've got B D E. You got so many options. Count them. Tell me. Tell me how many subsets of S has have either two or three elements. And I, I feel like you're gonna want this slide. All right. So give that a try. And so the secret here, hopefully you found it. It's gonna be to use combinations. Uh, and you want to consider the size two and the size three things separately, because you're, you're trying to count size two subsets and size three subsets. You, you know how to do each of those, just add them up, because they're, they're different things. So separately, what you want to do is count all the size two subsets, and then also the size three subsets separately. Okay, so that means you got a size six set, and you want the size two things, number of size two subsets, so that's six choose two. And you want to add that count to six choose three. How many ways are there to choose three things? Uh, where order doesn't matter out of a size six thing. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can you can think about it this way in terms of the formula, or you can think about it intuitively. It's like for six choose two, it's going to be like, all right, you're taking two things, so compute all the permutations of two things out of six elements. So that's six times five, and then you're double counting because like you have two things, like maybe you got like one two, or in our case, maybe you got like a b. You also have b a. You're going to see it again, and so you have to divide by how many times you're going to overcount it, and that's going to be two factorial, so divided by two times one. So that's six choose two, and so six choose three then is gonna be, all right, how many ways are there to permute uh, three things in a size six set? So it's six times five times four over, how many times are gonna double count everything? It's gonna be three factorial times. So three times two times one. So that's gonna be the answer. I'm not gonna like give you the number, but uh, feel free to calculate it if you would like. It's probably decently large. So yeah, that's that one. Um, hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Please yell at me if it does not. So that's fun stuff involving permutations and combinations. Now we are experts for those and these. Let's next talk about permutations when you're allowed to repeat things. So this is a permutation with repetition. That gets a little interesting because like when you have the same thing twice, the the order doesn't really matter of those two things. They're not two separate things. They're two of the same thing. And that, that will make more sense with an example. So it's an ordering of a set of items in which some of the items may be identical to each other. And so like, for example, maybe you want to permute all the letters in the word lol. Okay. So if you did this in the normal way, you want to count all the permutations of the, the letters LOL. Really, you're going to generate it a few times. Like you consider the L's to be separate. 
in the in the normal way that we know how to do right now. It's like L1 and then an O and then an L2. And like you're generating the permutation L O L2, and also you're gonna generate the permutation L2 O L1. But they're both wall, right? In 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 our definition of permutation, like these are different things, but in reality they're they're both wall. We should consider them to be the same thing. So that's that's double counting and when when duplicates come in, into play, when repetition comes into play, we have a new formula, right? So some permutations are end going to end up being the same as those, like this one. These two are going to be the same permutation, right? We should count them to be the same. We shouldn't double count them, all right? So uh yeah, what are what are the real different permutations? You got lol, you've got l l o, you've got o l l. I think you've got three total rather than six, right? Because that would be uh, three factorial. So it's different. It's different. We need to take that into consideration, right? So let's see. How do I want to do this? Um, yeah, the the trick is going to be. The trick is going to be counting locations. All right, so let's do Beyonce first. That's my fun example. So let's let's count all the ways to permute the letters in Beyonce, and then I'll show you a formula, and it's gonna or a re, or a, a way of reasoning, and I'll show you that it's gonna work the same for law. All right, so let's let's do Beyonce first. So uh, this the the question is the trick is to think about what. You're, you're trying to permute these letters. Let's permute all the letters of Beyonce. You've got some repetition. you got two E's repeated, right? The trick is going to be like to pretend that you're filling in slots. So there's seven letters in the word Beyonce. Let's pretend we got seven blanks. That is almost seven. There we go. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blanks. And now the question is, all right, what do we do? There's where do we where do we put the e's, right? Because the e's could go like you could you have the first e here, the second e here, or this could have been the second e and this could have been the first e. They're supposed to be the same. So the question is, the first thing we should do is pick where we're going to put those repeated things. Where where are we going to put those e's? And so there's seven choose two ways of picking where we're going to put the e's because order doesn't matter. Does that make sense? That's what combinations give to you. So it's like all right. Uh, that gives you back like, all right, maybe we're going to put it in indices two and six. Like we're, we're trying to find a size two subset of a size seven set, right? What are those indices where I should put my E's and the order of them doesn't matter. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out subsets. So that's how you figure out where to put the E's because they're like, you don't want the first E to be different from the second E. It doesn't matter. So like maybe we're going to pick that the E goes here and the E goes here. It doesn't matter if this was the first E or the second E and vice versa. So that's seven choose two. We're choosing a set, a subset for the indices for where to put those E's. We're going to do that first. And then you have five empty slots left over for non E's, right? So that's where you put everything else. Then there's five locations for every other letter, and there's five other letters. So five factorial options for the rest of them. And so in total, you have to take time, find where to put the E's, seven choose two ways to do that. And you're going to multiply that with how you choose once you've like you filled in two slots now with with your E's. Where do you put the other five characters? Now it's just a normal permutation. You're per you're permitting the letters over the other uh, slots that are open still. Does that make sense? So that's the secret. And then you'll you'll fill those in. All right. So in the, in a similar vein, what you do is if you're trying to permute all the letters of lol, there's three characters total. First, you need to figure out where you're going to put the duplicated things. Where are you going to put the L's? There are three char three slots, and there's two duplicated characters. There's two L's that we need to find spots for. So three, there's three to choose two spots for that L. For the L's. And it's like maybe you choose to put them here or something. And then there's one spot left over for the other character, for the O. There's one spot left for the O, and so it's really 3 choose 2 times 1. And so it's really, this is the answer, this times that. I hope that's making some sense. So in general, there is a formula for it, but like that's the way I want you to think about it. So let's let's do it this way. Let's scramble Mississippi, and then we'll, we'll find a generalization of our formula. 
So Mississippi, how many characters? I, I think I counted before. It has 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 characters. So that's disgusting. So let me make 11 boxes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You got 11 slots to fill. All right. And then Mississippi has, oh gosh, it's got one M, one M. It's got how many I's? Four I's. Uh, then it's got a bunch of four S's. Disgusting. Uh, and then two P's. Is that everybody? Eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah, so that's everybody. That's the counts. And so we got a, quite a few duplicates. All right, so let's figure this out. So we save our, uh, our non-duplicated things for last. We're going to deal with the duplicates first. All right, so we're going to place like the I's, the S's, and the P's. Does that make sense? So here's what we're going to do about it. We need to place our four I's first. All right, so we got four I's to place, and order of which I was which it doesn't matter that we're putting the second I first or something. The order doesn't matter, so we're making subsets. We're saying we've got 11 slots to fill, and we got four I's to place in those slots. So give me all the ways I can choose four indices to put all my I's at. And that's going to be 11 choose 4. All right, so this is, these are the number of ways to place the I. So we got four I's to place. Four, four I's to place. I don't know, some people put like apostrophes there. I don't know the best way to do it. Uh, so there's that. And OK, then we filled in the I's. We put them somewhere. Like maybe we chose this index for an I, this index for an I. Uh, this index for an I, and this index for an I. Doesn't really matter. That's supposed to be an I there. Uh, and then, all right, now it's time for S's. So we filled in four slots already out of the 11. So how many do we have left? Seven, right? We have seven slots that are blank still to fill. And we need to find four of those seven slots to put an S in. Does that make sense? So now, for our S's, we have seven slots to fill and four S's to find indices for. So that's, that's how you calculate how many you need to put there. So that's now we have four S's, four S's. And then I think you get the idea. So now we've placed S's somewhere, like one S, uh, two S, three S, four S, you place them. Now I need to place my P's. I need to find two indices to place my P's. How many do I have left? I have three left, see that? So I have three slots, I need to choose or it doesn't matter, two of them to place my P's because the P's, like, there's no difference between the first P and the second P. I just know that I have two of them, so I'm making subsets here. So those are my P's placed now. So maybe I place them, uh, we're ranging over all the examples, by the way, so it doesn't matter. This is just a particular example. Uh, and then we have one slot left. We have one slot left for the M. And so honestly, uh, it's one choose one, right? It's just one. So there's one slot left for the M. You have only one option at that point. And technically, if you wanted to think about it in terms of the other things, like you have, you have one slot to fill, you have one thing to place there, and the answer is one. So that's that's how you do that. And so that is going to be your formula, or that's how you, that's the intuitive way. There is a nice formula that your book gives you, and here's here's the secret. So what you do. Like, we, like we've been doing, we assign each character that we're trying to fill to a number, like one, two, all the way. And so here's the formula. The, distinct, the number of distinct sequences with n one ones, n two twos, or sorry, I guess they're, they're trying to say that, all right, have m be number one, uh, change it to the digit one, have i be the digit two, etc. So like you're changing numbers, change every character into a number, sure. So with n one ones and two twos and k k's, where the sum of all of the size of the sequence is n, so that's the individual one. Here it is. Here's the answer. And so it's like n factorial, which is the size of your whole thing, your whole string, I guess. So eleven factorial over, and then the answer is going to be uh, what do we do here? over all these things, over all the duplicates. So we had uh, 
we had, I think, what was it? Four, well, four factorial for, because that's how many eyes we had, times, what do we got? Uh, four factorial again, two factorial. So we had four S's, that's how you read the formula. Two for the P's and then one, right? One for the M, so one factorial, which is just one. Not supposed to be a four. So that's what the formula gives you. And let's, let's show that that's exactly what we've been doing here. So this is 11 choose four is according to our definition, uh, 11 factorial over four factorial times seven factorial, n minus r. So that's this. That's 11 factorial over four factorial times seven factorial. And then this one, multiply that by seven, choose four. That's gonna be seven factorial following the formula over four factorial times seven minus four, three factorial times three factorial, right? Three choose two, three factorial over two factorial times three minus two factorial, which is one factorial. And then one over here, which is just one choose one, if you wanna think about it that way, that's one factorial over one factorial times one minus one factorial, which is zero factorial. And zero factorial, by the way, is just one. That's the number one, it expands to be just one. So there's that one. And so that's the formula. And notice how a lot of these cancel. The sevens cancel, the threes cancel, the ones cancel, and the, the zero factorial just goes away to one. So it really is the formula. It's 11 factorial over four factorial, four factorial, two factorial, one factorial, just the counts of the individual duplicated, duplicated things. And then ones for all the things that weren't duplicated. And you just have one 11 factorial, the, the original thing on top, because everything else gets canceled. So yeah, that's, that's one way to think about it. I guess on a test, maybe that's the faster way, but intuitively, hopefully you see what's going on now. Here's a question for you to try now. So how many ways are there to permute the letters in the word college? So you got some duplicates there. So here's the formula, here's the intuition, all that fun stuff. Give that a try. So I got some duplicates. So the L's are duplicated and the E's are duplicated. All right. So you got how many letters total? You got seven slots to fill, right? Seven slots to fill. And so according to the formula, it's like, all right, let's place the duplicated things. Let's place the L's. We got seven slots to fill. Let's place two L's. And then we have five slots left to place two E's. And then finally, what's left is going to be, uh, then we have a C, an O, and a G left to place. Uh, and then they could be in any order. Then it's just three factorial. Okay. And you can get that. That's going to be equivalent to our equation here, to our formula. It's going to be seven factorial over two factorial times two factorial. And then the duplicated things again. So that's this three factorial ends up being part of this here. Uh, and then it's going to be if you're following the formula, it's just one factorial times one factorial times one factorial, because each of those, that C, that O, and that G, those are duplicated just once. That's how you read it. And so those will be, end up being equivalent, same answer, uh, but uh, it depends on how you want to think about it. Do you want to just follow the formula, or do you want to know why the formula works? I don't know. I'm biased, as I am the teacher. So yeah, that is a fun little example. And so I have one last topic uh, for for this little lecture that we're in. We'll have to stop in just a second, but I wanna teach you now how to count what's called a multi-set, which is interesting. So a multi-set is, it's like a set, but actually duplicates are allowed this time. Uh, order still doesn't matter, but duplicates are okay, all right? So in a multi-set, we consider each similar item, each th of the same thing to be indistinguishable. So the order doesn't matter for any of them. It's just like, this is what a multi-set looks like. It's where you can have multiple sevens and like in real set theory like the sevens go away the duplicates don't matter it's just like was there a seven or was there not but in a multi-set this is one two and four sevens this is one two and a single seven they are different for multi-set land all right so for example multi-sets they come up a lot like uh, for money for example i think you'd rather have uh, use multi-sets for what's in your wallet right you'd rather want this set rather than this one right shouldn't be the same yeah that's the idea so um, what the kinds of problems that we can solve with this are like how to like fill stuff, how to fill a basket with n items for, from m different varieties, okay? So this is the kind of problem we're about to s figure out how to solve. So say like 
we've got our Easter basket, very, very relevant. Uh, and let's say we want to fill it with puppies. Why not? All right. So let's say that our basket is capable of holding 10 dogs. Like this is a, an example problem that we can solve now. It can hold 10 dogs, 10 puppies, and there are four different breeds to choose from. Maybe we've got like golden retrievers, Labrador retrievers, chihuahuas, and uh, poodles or something. Those are our four different kinds of dogs to pick and put into our basket. And we have like an unlimited supply of them. And we consider dogs of the same breed to be indistinguishable. So it doesn't matter like you took golden retriever number one versus golden retriever number two. Like they're, they're indistinguishable, just like sevens are indistinguishable. Uh, and we want to put 10 dogs in our basket. How many ways can we do it? How many different ways? All right. That's what we're trying to solve now. So dun, dun, dun. here's the secret to figure out this answer. Like how, how can we fill this basket with uh, 10 items from four different varieties? The secret is to translate the problem into a binary string, surprisingly. It's very interesting. So imagine, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that each outcome of how we can fill our bucket uh, is a binary string. All right, let's, let me show you how this works for dogs. It's legitimately possible. So we've got uh, 10 dogs to pick, 10 puppies to put in our, in our Easter basket, 10 dogs to choose, and four breeds of dog to choose from. Okay, uh, here's the secret. What you do is you make a binary string with ones of like, you number the breeds. You say like, all right, in order, it's going to be golden retriever, lab, chihuahua, poodle. And then you start putting ones for all the ones in the first category. So like how many golden retrievers are you placing in your basket? And you put a one for how many you're taking. One, one let's say we're taking three golden retrievers. So that's three total. Sweet. All right. And then once you're done pick, picking golden retrievers and you want to move on to picking labs, so we're trying to count all the possibilities, you might eventually want to do that, you put a zero to separate it. This is going to turn into a binary string for all of the different options. And then let's say, all right, we want four, four Labrador puppies. So we put four ones in this category, because that was category number two, apparently. It's arbitrary. And they're like, I'm done picking labs. I want something different. So you put a zero. This is how we translate our picks into binary strings, and then it's easier to count the strings. All right, so then you pick how many chihuahuas you want. Say like, all right, I want two chihuahuas. So you put two there, two ones, and then to separate it and know that, all right, now I'm trying to count how many puppies, or not puppies, how many poodles I'm trying to get. Then you fill it in with ones to add it up to 10, because like it's supposed to be 10, so that's seven, eight, nine, so you gotta put a one here. You could put like three here and just a zero and nothing here, that's fine. It's just like the zeros separate the, the things. Does that make sense? That's the secret. The zeros separate the categories. And so zero is your separator. And each way of choosing adds up to a length. Well, you got to have 10 ones and three zeros as separators. So it's going to be a length 13 string. All right. So the secret is it's going to be like you have a length 13 string of zeros and ones and you kind of what you want to do is you want to pick where you put the zeros essentially like that's that's going to be that's going to give you everything right so it's like picking where you want the zeros to go in this string picking where you want the zeros to go in the string everything else is like forced to be a one So hopefully you see that every one of your options is uniquely determined by a 13 character string of binary stuff, where there's exactly 10 ones uh, in the string. And so you're forced to have the rest be ones. You're forced to have n. It's going to be n ones, right? Because you're trying to choose n things. So uh, our answer here is going to be 13, because we got 13 characters in our string. Choose three, because we just have to pick where to put the zeros. That's going to give us all our options, where, where the zeros went, because there has to be exactly 10 ones in the other slots. 
and that's going to tell me how many different ways I can choose my puppies. If there's an unlimited supply of each of them, like you could have taken just 10 golden retrievers. That's that is counted by this. That's just a that's 10 ones and three zeros. I hope you see that. So yeah, in general, the number of ways to select n objects from a set of m varieties is the following. You've got 10 for our example, it's 10 and 4, right? It's going to be n plus m minus 1 because that's how many characters in your binary string. That'll be 13, right? 10 plus 4 minus 1. That's 13 characters total. Choose m minus 1 because you got to you got to have your separators and it's just one less, right, than the total number of options because the, the last one doesn't need a zero at the end of it. So it's m choose m minus 1. Choose 3. So that's that's equivalent to this idea. Equivalent to picking where you want the zeros to go on your binary string of that exact size. And the rest are ones, right? And that's only assuming, though, you can take as much as each variety, uh, as much of each variety as you want. Like there's an infinite, su infinite supply of each. You can take all of all of one if you want it, and none none of anybody else. And objects of the same variety are indistinguishable. Like there's no like there's no best golden retriever. They're all just golden retrievers. You can just pick a couple. Doesn't matter. There's no numbering to them. So yeah, that's why it's a multi-set. The order doesn't matter. It's like got a bunch of sevens. They're indistinguishable. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the dog's example. Hopefully it makes sense now. I guess I did it kind of out of order, sorry. But you get the idea. It's going to be 13 choose 3. This is our bit string, binary string. And this is what we want to figure out. That's going to give us our answer. OK? So yeah, I think I want to save a multi-sets example for you for next time. It's kind of out of order. It's just, just this, this is a more of a review question. This one is not about multi-sets. Uh, but here, you try it. How many different strings of length 12 are there that contain exactly four Bs over the following alphabet, A, B, C, D? So your string has to be made up of only the characters A, B, C, and D. And then uh, the strings must be of length 12 and have exactly four Bs. Does that make sense? So see if you can figure that out. It's not going to be about, about multi-sets. It's going to be more about this kind of thing. So give that a try. So essentially, we're trying to enumerate all the different ways to fill in 12 slots, aren't we? So like, one, well, here are 12 slots. I'm a little lazy. So here's, you can fill in the rest in your mind. Three, four, and this is like slot 11, slot 12. And so the idea is we have four Bs. We got to place four Bs in this string somewhere. They're forced to be four of them. And so like, we got to pick four slots. They're, they're, they could be anything, but I've got uh, any Bs could go in any order. Order doesn't matter. So I got 12 slots, and I got four indices to pick out to place a B in. Does that make sense? So that's how you place the Bs. And then for the remainder of your string, how many slots do you have left? Well, uh, you have eight slots left to fill. If you filled four out of the, out of the 12, you got eight slots left to fill, and you can't use any Bs anymore, right? That's like out of the system. Like you placed your four Bs already. Now you have A, C, and D left to choose from. And you can have as many of each of those as you like. So now it's, it's like a combination of many things that we've learned. So now you have three options for the next character, because uh, it could have been A, A, C, or D. You have eight characters left. So three options for each of those. They could all be A, C, or D. They just can't be Bs. That's why it's three. You got eight slots left to fill, all right? Because uh, this one is because you can only choose can only choose uh, from A, C, and D. OK, that's the idea there. So that would be your final answer. I hope that makes sense. It's a combination of, uh, it's a combination of combinations, and then also just the product rule. OK, so yeah, I think that's where I want to stop today. Uh, a lot of fun new topics, new ideas, uh, and that is counting uh, to start. We're going to keep on going with counting next time.